Good morning, everyone. This is Daniel Simonton, the Associate Minister here at Grace. I want to welcome you here to worship this morning. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to remind you that there are different ways to connect to Grace. You can see that in our description. I also want to encourage you to fill out one of our connection cards. We'd love to know if you were here worshiping with us this morning, and so if you would, please do so. I do want to ask you to do one thing. If you haven't had a chance to check out our June newsletter, I ask that you would do that. Uh, Pastor Bill, myself, Linda, and others at the church, we are working through the guidelines that we have been given uh, by Bishop Frank Beard, as well as the Illinois Department of Public Health. We want to ensure that when we come back to worship at the end of the month, uh, that we do it safely. We want to make sure we're doing all those things to make sure that your health is our top priority. So we're working through those things. Check out the link here just to see some of the things that uh, we're going to be working through. Again, I want to thank you so much for gathering with us today. And as we gather on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning that the Lord has made, let us come together, uh, one voice, one heart, and pray the one prayer, the beautiful prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray, as we together say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I pray your health, I pray your safety, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would fan into flame the love of God and that you would feel the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Amen.
Good morning, Grace, friends, and family. Uh, I know that many of you are anxiously uh, awaiting the opportunity to get back into our church building for worship uh, as Daniel and I and Linda and everyone else uh, here around the church. Uh, uh, but there's a, a lot that's uh, got to happen and, and before we can do that and, and even... Uh, once we get to the point that we can come back together, there's going to be a lot of things that are different. So I just want you to be aware of that. And I want you to also realize that in the midst of all this, that uh, according to the guidelines that we've been given, that when we uh, come back together, if there's one person in the group that would test positive, then everybody that is a part of the worship experience that day we'll have to be quarantined for two weeks. Uh, and that's not optional, that's mandatory. So keep that in mind. But I don't want to focus on that this morning. I want us to focus on, on our time together, our, our time of worshiping God and God alone. We know that in the world around us and in the world in which we live, right, even right here in our own country, in our own backyard, or, there have been... Um, Many things that are happening, uh, protests, riots, uh, uh, people talking about justice and peace. And we know that looks uh, different for different folks in different situations. But here we are today uh, contemplating all of that as we gather for worship. Let me uh, open with prayer. God, today I just pray that as, as we come to worship you, Lord, that you would be uh, not only uh, in our hearts, but also in our lives and in all things. May you be in our thoughts, our words, our actions in such a way, Lord, that, that the, the, our neighbors and friends and family would know without a doubt that we are in love with you and that we know that, that you um, love us so much that you would give your one and only son for us. And because he was willing to give himself for us, we know that we owe our lives to him and everything that we are and everything that we are about. So just bless us, be with us today. Uh, keep us focused, Lord, upon you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And amen. Today I want to read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. Verses 34 through 40. It's a passage that's familiar to probably all of you, uh, or most of you, I should say. Beginning with verse 34. 
When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Once more, I pray for God's blessing to be added to the the reading and hearing and understanding of His Holy Word. In 2018, in a piece in New York Magazine, a man by the name of Max Reed inquired, how much of the internet is fake? He asked this not so much about factual content, but, or I should say, he didn't ask it just because of of the fake news that was rolling around, but rather because he had been doing some studying and, and Studies in general suggest that year after year, less than 60% of web traffic is is human. Some years, according to some researchers, a healthy majority of it is bot. Now you're asking, what is bot? Spelled B-O-T? I'm assuming it's it's, uh, short for robot, but bot is a software application that is programmed to do certain tasks. Bots are automated, which means that they run according to their instructions without a human user needed to start them up. Bots often imitate or replace a human user's behavior. Typically, they do repetitive tasks, and and they can do them much faster than human users can. Bots usually operate over a network. More than half of the Internet traffic is bots scanning content, interacting with web pages, chatting with users, and and looking for attack targets. The observation that Max Reed makes carries deep implications for the possibilities of truth and its perception. Beyond the mere unreliability of web page view counts or playback manipulation, inversion is Reed's key insight. He said, the inversion is the point at which there's so much fakery going on that our natural ability to tell the difference between what's real and what's fake becomes inverted. All real things all of a sudden seem totally fake to us, and and fake things have this sort of power and, and the presence of the real. If there's one thing... Christians today can and should do in light of these trends is to recapture a sense of wonder about reality as created after the pattern of Christ himself and become wary about the potential for digital media to not merely distort reality but to create a a hyper-reality. See, we know that digital media obviously exists and sometimes impossible to measure and vast horrifying effects happen in the world. But be cautious about how the effect of digital media is far more asking, far more than than just asking if a reported fact is correct or incorrect. Just like this young lawyer asking Jesus, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He got more than he asked for, but he also helps us to see that the Pharisees reveal an attitude toward law far different from that of Jesus. Instead of limiting the demand of the law, as the Pharisees do, to separate commandments that are kept or not, Jesus teaches the demand of the law embraces the fullness of our relationships with God, self, and neighbor. See, love defines our relationships. Love is the wellspring of obedience to any commandment. Love is the greatest commandment because it truly is the whole law of God. When the expert in the law asked Jesus a simple question, 
Jesus gave two simple answers. The greatest is loving God with everything you have, and the second greatest is loving others as much as you love and care for yourself. What? Jesus is merely... Jesus says that merely loving God completely and and loving others is, is the standard that we need. What sort of standard is this to live by? What can these two commandments mean? How can we explain this difficult tension? God seemingly demanding that we live a life that seems impossible, fully loving God and others. Well, some people might say that the commandment is to completely love God and others is just an ideal to admire. They, they say it's not really a commandment to keep. They, they try to explain away these, these commandments by saying that God doesn't actually expect us to, to complete, love Him completely or even love our neighbors. He merely wants us to admire that sort of life. And if we, if we took these words of Jesus in this way, then, then we could get away with loving God with some of our heart and, and loving some of our neighbors by, by letting ourselves off the hook when we say we still admire the idea of completely loving God and loving others. But you know what? Most of us wouldn't be satisfied if we said that well, you know, the rest of God's commandments, like not killing and, and not committing adultery, those are just merely ideas and ideals for us to admire. But then even as I say that, I realize that more of us think that way than what we would like to think. Some people might try to explain these high standards as something that we should strive for even though we know we'll never get there. These commandments encourage us to try harder to love God completely and try harder to love other people even though you, you, you never actually fully obey these commandments. But none of us can ever strive our way into holiness. We know that we can change by, by trying harder but we can never become perfect by striving. God has has created us, has built into us a hunger for holiness. And even, even unbelievers have high standards, especially for us Christians. However, we cannot work our way to holiness. I'll never forget the time when our daughter was attending Murray State University and playing volleyball. That first season that she was there, she had three Chinese women as teammates. And one of them made a comment in regard to the other girls using the word love. She said, you misuse the word love. She said, it means so much more than than the way you use it. And she was talking about us here in the United States using love in the way that that Barbara Brokoff called easy love. We say we love puppies or, or we love chocolate or we love red cars or we love big houses or we love roses or, or we love old hymns or, or we love babies with dimples or anything else that you can think of. Love is the most overworked, misunderstood, least practiced word of our time. And and the whole subject of love is too big for us, and the practice of it is almost completely beyond us. Think of what love is not. Love is not hugs and kisses and squeezes or little gifts to um, core or Red Cross or St. Jude's or songs about love or banners and buttons that say I love you or, or posters or, or cute little cartoon figures with, with these childish faces or, or love is not being sentimental or, or doing what is convenient because it's expected of you or 
someone will remark how good we are. Love is not doing something nice until you are tired of it or you think it's someone else's turn for a while or, or love is not a pat on the back and, and someone saying, have a nice day. And of course, love is never ever jealous or selfish or irritable or resentful or rude or proud. But think of what love is. Love is tough and hard and eternal. It goes on and on and on against impossible odds. Love is taking people where they are, as they are. Love is being kicked and not kicking back. Love is patient, long-suffering, and kind, and real, not fake or imitation or, or put on or make-believe or pretend. Love is impartial. You will help the person who needs it, even if he or she is under 30 or over 30, or, or Republican or Democrat, or Methodist or Protestant or Catholic, or, or no church at all, grateful or ungrateful, or somebody or nobody. Wow, when you thought, stop and think about that, that's, that's really being impartial. Love is forgiving and hopeful, and love is impossible to do by yourself. But you already knew all this about love. You've given mental agreement to that many times over. You believe it. But the hard, ugly truth is that even though we as Christians, we, we, we find that in theory all of this is fine, but in reality and in practice, it doesn't, just doesn't work out that way for us. <clears throat> Most of us have made commitments to love long before. Sometimes in church, sometimes outside of church. But I'm thinking right now about, <clears throat> about those of us who've, who've made that in church. We, we go to church and, and, we, and we got all inspired and we've decided that we're going to be different. We, we read the Bible a little bit more. We pray a couple minutes more each day and, and we go on a binge of being a better Christian. We, we're going to be a better Christian and we make a high resolve for ourselves. We're going to, to love, really love, love all the time, and, and love everybody. And, well, we do pretty good until one day we, we wake up with a bad headache, or a, a fresh cold, or we oversleep, or are late for work, or, or the children are difficult, or, or the milk for cereal is sour, or the car won't start, or, or the governor and, and the bishop says, stay at home and so you'll be safe and don't get the COVID-19. And whoever is closest to us at the moment gets the brunt of it, right? See, our reaction to, to some small trivial matter makes us talk and act anything but loving. So we, we chuck the whole project thinking, well, it's no use anyway. In order to, to live with ourselves, we, we rationalize our failure by saying, after all, I'm only human. Or everyone else feels this way sometimes. Or it's, it's just not natural to be loving all the time. And, and once again, we find our love is, well, as, as Barbara Brokoff would say, short of breath. Our love is short of breath. See, with easy love, we, we tried, we honestly tried, but we can't be loving all the time. And we are sick and tired of trying. And we are sick of, of feeling guilty about it. And, and we are ready to wash our hands of this whole loving mess. And you know, you're right. This is as good a time as any to realize that you can never make yourself love. Easy love 
becomes just an ideal to admire or, or a useless effort of trying harder to do something that we can't do on our own. And those people who, who easily and, and in a carefree manner say they love everybody are suspect in my book. And if you would be honest, they would be in your book too. Most of the time it's just words. Nothing more than words. And words about love are always easy. There's <clears throat> this one basic lesson that, that we keep forgetting. All of our loving depends upon our present relationship with Jesus Christ. This leads me to a third explanation of why Jesus said these are the greatest commandments. See, we as human beings can actually love God and others completely. And the reason I say that is because God never demands what God will not enable. God will enable us to love others but first he enables us to love him. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. Galatians 5, says the fruit of the Spirit is love. See, we can receive God's perfect love by the Holy Spirit. And when we become full of God's Holy Spirit, we are full of love. I want you to note the order that, that Jesus gives these commandments, though. First, we have to take care of the God relationship, and then the human relationship. But here is our dilemma, especially here in, in the country where we live today. But I think it's true in, in all parts of the world. We as modern people have chosen to reverse this order. But it's impossible to love people because you know and I know that some people are just so unlovable that you can't even like them, right? But it's impossible to love people unless you love God first. Today's system that we live in is not Christian, but it's Humanism. We said, let people be the focal point. Let, let people be first. Let people be pre preeminent. But this, is, this human awareness has cost us. We've lost our, our God awareness. And as a result, we soon don't care too much for God or people. Do you see why... All of your loving depends upon your present relationship with Jesus Christ. When we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when we see Jesus, Jesus shows us our sins. So we see our sins. But then we also see that Jesus loves me, loves you, accepts me, accepts you. Now, we can see others in a new light. You know, this happens to be Trinity Sunday. The Sunday after Pentecost in the church calendar is always Trinity Sunday. So let me point out that, that God the Father, Son, and Spirit love each other supremely. When the Spirit fills us, the Spirit loves the Father and Son completely, and we do too. God the Spirit loves all humans also. When we are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit loves our neighbors like the Spirit loves us. Being filled with God's Spirit can enable a life of love, loving God and others like God loves If you've been with us the past few weeks, you've noticed, I pray, 
that we've been talking about living a life of holiness, being filled with the Holy Spirit, with the power of Pentecost, and, and living a sanctified life. Once filled with the Spirit of God, God will do all of the loving through us. See, in our human state, we still try to do it by ourselves, for ourselves, with ourselves. But God has always intended to do the loving through us. I would ask today that you begin a period of pondering your spiritual state. If you want this country to be a better country, it has to start right here inside each one of us. Consider your spiritual state. Will, will you begin today seeking this filling until you receive it? Are you ready to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit today? I pray that you are. And I want you to know that, that this message today is not a bot. It's not fake news. This is good news. This is the gospel. Amen and amen. I then shall live as one who's been forgiven. I'll walk with joy to know my debts. My Father, I am His child, and I am not afraid. So greatly pardoned, I'll forgive my brother. shall live as one who's learned compassion. I've been so loved that I'll risk loving too. I know how fear builds walls instead of bridges. I'll dare to this point of view and when relationships demand commitment then I'll be there to care and follow through your kingdom come around in me your power and glory let them shine through me your hallowed name oh may I bear with honor and may your lips